Before I introduce our lecturer, Michael Kokor, I just wanted to say a few things about um, these architecture uh, lectures. I wanted to do something a little bit different this year and include um, a sort of like an informal architecture specific lecture series within the public lecture series. I'm sneaking them in. Um, so these are all sponsored by the Swanson Fund, so we're grateful for that. And we're going to have like seven different architecture lectures throughout the course of the year. And um, so these, the, the lecturers, the visiting architects, will range from, you know, practitioners, educators, theoreticians, um, or, you know, there's a whole range of focus and interest uh, you'll see in scale of work. Um, so, and in most cases, um, each architect will spend all three of those categories of, you know, being a practitioner, educator, and a thinker. Um, so, as I said, each one of the visiting architects' disciplinary focus will be very different, you know, ranging from architecture, urbanism, uh, robotics, uh, digital technologies, um, to sort of theory and history. But there is a common thread, which is that they're all globally emerging voices, um, you know, who will share their bodies of work and research, but also reflect on what it means to be emerging in the contemporary condition, um, which I hope will, you know, provide some relevant discussion um, school-wide, hopefully. Um, so I would like to thank the Swanson Lecture Fund for sponsoring us to make this happen. Um, tonight's lecturer, Michael Kokora, is our first uh, visiting lecturer in architecture. Uh, he's coming from Hong Kong. Uh, he came with his bicycle from Hong Kong, so yesterday we did a bike tour of Detroit um, with Susan as well as um, some first-year students. Um, and Michael had some quality time to reflect on Detroit, which I think will come up today. Um, so Michael Kokor is a partner at Object Territories, where he leads the office together with Miranda Lee and Marcus Carter. He's an assistant professor at the University of Hong Kong and teaches in the Master of Architecture and Master of Landscape Architecture programs, where he has been working to develop alternative development visions in Myanmar. Um, recent projects that his firm did include a park in Da Nang, Vietnam, a master plan for revitalizing the Erie Canal in New York, a landscape revitalization plan for downtown Oakland, and a museum and master plan in South Korea. Goes on and on, a science museum in Lithuania, a winery in northern China. I think he will talk about some of these. Prior to founding Object Territories, Michael was a partner at OMA, and he led the office's work in Asia. Michael holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from University of Minnesota and a Master of Architecture degree from the Yale School of Architecture. And perhaps uh, one interesting connection to um, the architect who shaped our campus is uh, Michael received the Saarinen Scholarship for Design at Yale. So there he is. Um, so welcome, Michael. Thanks, John. Um, I felt like this was the first lecture I had to physically train for it. As you all know, John's a pretty hardcore cyclist, so <laughs> I felt like I had to physically train. Um, but uh, I also uh, received a really great tour of the school uh, from Capiche. She walked me through various studios, and I, I was able to see how the studios work together, kind of the scale of the environment. I'd never been to Cranbrook before. Uh, of course, I knew of Cranbrook, but it was really exciting for me to see the kind of inner workings. And then, of course, today to be a part of some of the critiques. I felt like uh, this is the way I've always wanted architecture and art design to be taught, actually, where it's really cross-disciplinary. And at this scale, it, it seems really easy to be able to do it that way. And I was, yeah, I'm really struck struck by that. And 
hopefully in this talk I can get into get into that a bit too because I, I want to critique a little bit the our, our my discipline discipline of architecture and the way it's been operating uh, in certain ways I'll, I'll, I'll come to that later uh, but to so to start with uh, just first I, I think there was a kind of synopsis sent out to everyone a, a little bit what this is about but um, my office is uh, intensely interested in negative space, the space between buildings, and is quite, in a way, trying to be critical of uh, architecture in general and landscape and urbanism, the way it's been practiced, and uh, is really intensely interested in, yeah, just that kind of negative condition, hence sort of the title of this talk. Um, I'm gonna go through a number of different urban conditions that I've had kind of intimate personal experience with and try to share those with you. And then maybe at the end we can have some kind of interactive dialogue, which I realized after my tour was really a strength of Cranbrook. So I don't have any hesitation about doing that since we had quite an interactive discussion <laughs> earlier today. Um, so this will dwell a lot on urban room kind of as I say, removal, uh, issues of subtraction, uh, issues of overbuilding, and these certain kinds of experiences which our cities are going through. And I think are a number of different urgency, urgencies and crises that we're, we're, we have the opportunity to deal with as, as architects and designers. Um, this plays a little bit differently in a, Asian audience, this introduction, but I think it's it's important because, uh, as Jaron mentioned, um, I, I st we started our office well only two years ago, so it's quite quite young, and this is really a kind of formative period, I think, for anyone starting their offices in within the first first few years. So, um, I've and, and after leaving a kind of professional certain professional situation. I've had time to really think about and reflect upon kind of what inspires me as an architect. And maybe like many of you, especially in the arts, uh, comes back to perhaps some traumatic experience in your past somehow. So this is where I'm from. Um, not so dissimilar from Detroit, but this kind of uh, urban landscape, I think, really shaped me. As you can see, the most dominant figure in this landscape is, of course, the freeway, the highway. Uh, there, I guess, maybe because this is Minneapolis, it's negative spaces are perhaps the lakes, and those are the voids. But seriously, the, the dominant landscape is really about the roads. And some of my first memories were of this, the kind of 70s fuel crisis, uh, where my family had to really decide, do we buy food or do we buy gas? Because if we don't buy gas, we can't go to work to buy food either. So it was this kind of disturbing conundrum that's sort of a direct result of the American economy and American infrastructure. and. This is the landscape also that I grew up in, and this, the space of the street was the dominant public space. You know, we played baseball here, played football here. This is where we interacted. Um, as a reaction to that, very early when I started studying architecture, I became really interested in the space between buildings and the kind of space that I wasn't a part of uh, early in my life. Um, really this kind of interstitial space, negative space, which of course I think naturally led to uh, the kind of artwork that I am still interested in and continues to inspire in certain ways my, I hope, and, and I'm hoping to continue now. Of course, Michael Heiser's double negative. I really like to think about this piece in, a, in an urban context, the way such a kind of simple but powerful gesture is able to unite over a great distance. Um, 
two very, uh, this kind of unbelievable edge. I think it's, it's really striking. Similarly with Gordon Matta Clark, uh, of course he's a, was an, an architect in his short career and been really interested in the way cutting an ax of removal will reveal layers and completely change and redefine, redefine space. I think he was, was actually still, in many ways, acting as an architect was, wasn't something he could fully resist. I mean, when you look at this, this is incredibly spatial. I mean, it's, at the same time, revealing kind of the thinness, cheapness of uh, contemporary construction and things. And, and especially in Day's End, I mean, it's really impossible not to think of this as some kind of modern day industrial cathedral-like space. Another figure who's influenced me um, quite a lot is uh, Michel Foucault with uh, his work and his lecture about uh, heterotopias. I love this image of him overlooking kind of parts of medieval Paris. Um, of course, his, one of his, I forget if this is in the third, maybe the third principle of heterotopias, but uh, the example of the Persian garden, this collision of where sacred and profane could coexist and interact in a kind of vast public space. Um, something else I'm, I guess something, so this is where, th those are kind of influences and uh, I think you'll see them start to resonate through what I talk about further, but uh, this is something I'm quite critical of is these kind of analyses of cities that try to quantify certain aspects. This is a from a Grosner report, Re Resilient Cities. Um, first of all, I'm not sure about the term resiliency in, in cities at all, but maybe that's something we can discuss later too. Um, but this, this kind of, this, this, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this, but this ranking you know, deals with socioeconomic factors, landscape factors, uh, ability to respond to disasters and things, but I think it ignores a lot of very important factors in cities, and if you, if you look at kind of the top three and the bottom three, in terms of cities that are A, growing, uh, and B, spatially incredibly interesting, I, I would kind of be tempted to invert, invert the list. Um, maybe only Detroit sort of <laughs> makes sense in the spectrum. Um, I mean, it's also kind of a short list of, of cities. Um, but. So like I said, the, the cities at the bottom of the list are the ones that are growing enormously in terms of population, have incredibly rich, dynamic, cultural, spatial circumstances. And I'm gonna talk about some of these. So I, I think, I, I'm not sure what this is really trying to say. Uh, I mean, should we, should we look to places like Toronto, Vancouver, and Calgary as exemplary cities and, and urban condition. Can we really learn from that? I'm, I'm not so sure. I think we can learn, learn from others. So the first one I want to talk about is uh, a city I've had quite a bit of experience with is Jakarta. And um, why I, th I mean, in terms of so-called resiliency, I think it's quite an amazing place. Uh, of course, started out as a Dutch colonial port um, and endured sort of 300 years of uh, pretty brutal uh, Dutch colonial rule, um, slavery, essentially the Indonesian population, much of it was enslaved for the Dutch. And only after a traumatic uh, event like World War II did it, um, and, and kind of subsequent Dutch withdrawal, did it uh, obtain its independence in 1945 basically two days after the war. And then after that, had the unfortunate experience of enduring a 30-year military dictatorship. And only again with another trauma, the Asian economic crisis did, um, did that change. And since that time, more or less, I mean, the city has, since uh, you know, shortly after, I mean, a few years after independence, I mean, grown enormously, five million 
you know, 25 million people in the past 40 years. I don't know what would happen if we put 25 million people in Toronto or Calgary or something. Let's, let's talk about resilience again. Um, but this is Jakarta today, uh, that colonial city I mentioned still exists somewhere in here. It's kind of been abandoned since independence is, and now it's currently kind of being revived. But what I wanted to talk about within this, these photos, I mean, it's of course an enormous condition, but this is what I like to call a, a kind of urban soup. And <laughs> I, I really, I really have come to love cities like this because if you look at it, there's this collision of different textures, different urban fabrics, different scales that results in a, a kind of spatial complexity that uh, I think doesn't exist in, in many places. Of course, Jakarta has its own series of problems, you know, infrastructure, flooding, uh, kind of rich, poor divide. It's facing a, a huge number of crises, largely due to that military dictatorship. But within it, there's such a kind of amazing, I mean, this is kind of perfect vision of mat or kind of infinite mat urbanism in a way. Um, but speaking of heterotopia, speaking of negative space, this kind of street I, I find incredibly rich. Um, every space in the city feels used. This is an informal school underneath a highway. This is for children who normally don't go to school. This is their math class. Um, this is the lobby of an office, sort of entrance of, a, of an office building here. So at night, basically, it becomes a restaurant. And within that urban soup, um, there's also a kind of beautiful sort of oasis moments. Uh, this is the first project by quite a well-known Indonesian architect, uh, Andre Matin. Um, but I, I've always, every time I've come to Jakarta, I've experienced this a kind of new surprise in that, you know, the, this so-called urban soup. And this was definitely one of those surprises. And so far, that kind of uh, messy soup, as it were, has mostly resisted, this is a mall in, in Jakarta, but mostly resisted this kind of development and condition, although it's, it's encroaching. Uh, the next urban condition I want to talk about is one that I have uh, been living in the past 10 years. So this is the Pearl River Delta, kind of aerial view over it, um, and Shenzhen. Uh, for those of you who may not know Shenzhen so well. It was a fishing village. Uh, looked like this in the 80s. And when it was made a special economic zone, kind of went through a massive uh, kind of process of deconstruction of that landscape, flattening of, of spaces, um, cutting down mountains, transforming it into a kind of buildable landscape and city. Tons of reclamation have since happened. This is kind of one of the first initial plans. And kind of decade by decade, this has been sort of the growth pattern. You can see continuously adding land. And this is when I first arrived in Shenzhen. This is what the city looked like. There were times when this was a photo I took when I was living there. Um, literally, the sky was orange from the amount, the soil's orange. So this is really from the amount of construction dust in the air. I mean, it really phenomenal sunsets you get with this. Um, and this is what it looks like today uh, compared to a fishing village. It's quite, quite an amazing, enormous metropolis now. Um, to build that metropolis, this was, these were some of the first urban plans, basically. Um, how to deal with rapid growth, how to deal with constructing a city like this. This was planning for uh, basically migrant workers that would build the city. And this is what some of that urban texture looked like um, and still looks like in some places today. And I would argue this is 
also some of the most vibrant uh, urban space in modern Chinese cities. Um, it's basically this really dense grid of seven to nine floor buildings, um, sometimes only a meter or two apart. Incredibly, incredibly dense. Everything is wrapped with ceramic tiles. Essentially, it's one giant indoor outdoor bathroom. <laughs> if you like, you can transform uses, hose it down, and reuse it, and everything will work. But it, it has a really quite amazing, I think, talk about kind of a heterotopia in these kinds of conditions. It's some of the most interesting urban space, at least in a modern Chinese city. Um, perhaps the only thing that would recall a kind of uh, Tutong type space or or village even, but on an urban scale. And this is the, the kind of shops that exist, you know, kind of beauty salon next to appliance sales, next to an outdoor kitchen, next to lumber sales. And then kind of within the context of adjoining high rise growth. I mean, I think it's a really radical contrast compared to what you see in most of greater China, which is super block planning, um, which is something I'm quite critical of. It's really just an appropriation from Russian super block planning. And I mean, there was kind of a weird point in Chinese history where uh, America helped China in World War II, and then well, kind of reversal happened. And I don't know which would have been worse, sort of taking what I showed you in the beginning, American planning to China or Russian planning. But I could have wished China could evolve into its own Chinese planning, not not this. Um, so what's happening with those urban villages that I showed you earlier, most of them are being destroyed uh, to make way for more so-called contemporary and kind of dominance of the super block gradually it's taking, continuously taking over with this kind of bland, generic corporate architecture. Um, but I, I really, I'm an advocate for this kind of more experimental textures in the city. Um, another Chinese city I want to talk about is the uh, city of Kashgar. Uh, this is actually, I'll, I'll be showing soon a, a thesis student of mine, her project in the context of this city. Uh, if you know Kashgar, basically it was a very prominent city on the Silk Road, uh, ancient city rich with Islamic uh, culture and architecture, dense Medina-like fabric, naturally given the kind of Islamic condition and the fact that uh, the woman in an Islamic society, the only time she can be unveiled is when outside is, when, of course, in a private space. So that's why this kind of texture is, I think, so important to the, the family unit in this Islamic society. Um, but uh, it's being erased. Of course, we hear all the time uh, in the news about uh, the kind of Uyghur condition with respect to this area of, of China and the ethnic minority being blamed for terrorism. But it's basically a site of uh, ethnic cleansing, I would say. Um, these are city images around the city wall, you know, police, heavily, heavily police area questioning the Uyghur population. Uh, this is a demolition plan for the old city uh, put together by the Chinese government. So these kinds of streets and conditions are being demolished piece by piece under the guise of uh, seismic instability. Um, even though the city's existed for about a thousand years in this way, you know, the Chinese say it's dangerous. You know, it's uh, using kind of a seismic excuse to to destroy it. Um, so gradually, you're getting this kind of generic urbanism encroaching on the old city, and eventually, that sort of texture will be completely gone, and with it, uh, quite likely, the Uyghur. Islamic culture, uh, which I think is really a good
depressing moment for, and will be in the future of Chinese history, I think. So this is where my thesis student's project starts. Uh, Estelle Chan is her name. Um, basically, this is the kind of uh, cultural erasure that's in progress. Uh, the intention, I mean, is to, the red being the Han Chinese, the green being the, the Uyghur population, um, essentially to begin to push them out. Um, and yeah, it, it basically erase that culture as much as possible. So she, her, her ambition was to create a kind of balance. How can, how can an architect work in this context and create a kind of symbiosis or kind of maintain a sort of cultural, cultural balance and resolve, resolve that condition? So she started working with a number of kind of subtractive techniques and additive techniques to try and see how, see how that could play out. Uh, this was some of her, her planning. So she wasn't going to say, no, we just have to freeze the city and keep it and take a, a really kind of conservationist approach. But she also wanted to understand and kind of embrace what the, the Chinese government's excuse is, the kind of seismic condition and see how she can still create a kind of coexistence of the two ideals. So seismic stability with uh, the cultural condition, which is basically defined by the urban texture. So this is how she did it. She uh, began with a series of cast in place wall-like elements that would create a sort of armature um, for maintaining that fabric. So what you see in the dark is, is that armature. Here's some of her models. Um, so things could still be demolished, but then new spaces would form, and there would be this sort of cast, uh, cast space. So this is, this is kind of on the lower part. The upper part is a section through this, her proposal for the city and how the city could be or how those walls could be constructed over, over time. It's kind of uh, like a Rachel White read on an urban scale. Um, so pieces that would be, that would either later collapse or be demolished, you know, you'd still have that impression left in the walls of the future city. And there would be still modern elements and ways to occupy these, the, kind of the poche of the walls. And then potentially that texture uh, could leave the kind of boundaries of that city and therefore allowing simultaneously the Uyghur population to grow along with the Chinese population. Um, another place I'm working, I'm not going to show the actual project, but I think um, it's, this is a quite an interesting site and this, this leads to, so that First part is mostly about um, urban re removal and subtraction, cutting away in cities and certain textures in cities. Uh, this part gets to kind of the overbuilding issue, but just, just before I get to that, so this is a site of a winery that we're working on um, in far northern, so we're moving a little bit east from Kashgar, uh, kind of northeast China, right on the border with Mongolia. Um, as you zoom, as we zoom out, the site of the winery, you can kind of see this reservoir here. Oops, there's a this kind of green spot is right here. So I keep zooming out. This is on the other side of the. These are the Hulan Mountains in Mongolia. And keep zooming out. You see, there's this kind of green strip in a way defined by the Yellow River and a whole lot of sand, right? So in the context of greater China, you can see this kind of green, greenish belt. Um, this is basically the front line for uh, the sandstorms that continuously hit Beijing and affect its air quality. So 
Of course, the government's been promoting a lot of agriculture. So actually, the wine is, is quite good. It's quite a good wine region, given the climate and desert, desert area. Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of win-win in terms of the government um, promoting economic growth and, and, and enterprise like, like winemaking, but it's also a way to address potentially this crisis of the sandstorms that affect this whole region in, in China. Um, and like I said, really using the Yellow River as the catalyst for that, you know, being able to fuel that kind of landscape. Um, and of course the condition in Beijing that it's trying to address. This is the kind of uh, view when you're coming in from an airplane into, into this landscape. This is more the winter view. Um, so a lot of the vines have been trimmed back and things. I don't know how much it'll really address the sandstorm issue because the sandstorms are largely in winter. Uh, most of the landscape is also gone in the winter here and there's not a lot of snow, but I think it's, it's a kind of attempt. This is more the summer view, but it's also, this, this area of China is quite well known for a lot of mineral extraction. In fact, the owner of the winery we're working with is in the mineral business and he's transforming his kind of interests and, and investment in the region. Uh, but it's also kind of, you see here is enormous solar farm um, as China tries to make its transition from dirty fuels to clean fuels. Of course, the desert's a perfect place for that. This is what the landscape looks like when you're in it, walking around. It's really quite lunar, <laughs> approaching the, the mountain range. And this is a culture kind of left over from the Shisha culture that was destroyed by the Mongol Empire. These are kind of funerary buildings. This is what the city looks like uh, within the city proper. Pretty typical Chinese urbanism. And this is where I get to the overbuilding part. Uh, this looks like it's under construction, but actually it's looked like this for the past five years, ever since the Chinese economy started declining. This is all speculative building and is essentially frozen. There's cranes, but they're not moving. There's shells of buildings. Yeah, nothing is, is happening here. This is the future CBD of this city, which is Yinchuan. Uh, but there are hundreds of cities in China that look like this. It's really quite amazing. And within Yinchuan itself, and this is another one, kind of frozen skeleton of a building. The only thing that was under construction at, actually at the moment was this park, park space. Uh, but within the city itself, there were are literally hundreds of buildings like this, just completely frozen in time and lying in wait for kind of economic improvement again. These are finished, but completely unoccupied. There were really hundreds of these in, in various states of completion. I... Um, I think it's kind of strange because most of these are outside of the city proper. And, you know, I question sort of the reason of building a new CBD when you already have this, it's kind of this endless sprawl condition. And I, I really, really wonder why the city did not decide to reinvest in the existing texture and kind of trying to redefine this in a more gradual rate rather than pure speculative, kind of speculative building. Um, it's kind of a abrupt segue, but to what's happening in New York City, um, I wanna talk a bit about the, the High Line and kind of related developments to the High Line. I think, of course, the High Line, I think is an incredible project in many ways, extremely transformative. Um, I think some of these photos are also great where you see a, this kind of juxtaposition. Um, yeah, again, I mean, I think this is, is 
quite amazing spatial conditions that have kind of have resulted. Uh, but at the same hand, I, I still wonder about what's kind of what's been lost. And I think uh, Joel Sternfeld's photography is something. He's an incredible photographer to start with, but I think the fact that he documented the condition of the High Line with these incredibly beautiful, kind of hauntingly beautiful photos is, has more and more relevance and it is a kind of early distant warning of what's happening around the High Line. Um, this was really an amazing landscape in and of itself. Uh, a lot of, the this, this school doesn't really deal so much with landscape architecture, but something I'm intensely interested in and in terms of a multidisciplinary school like Cranbrook um, and other schools, I, I think it's something that should be, well, in my opinion, there should not be separate disciplines between architecture and landscape and urbanism. I think they should all be integrated into one. It's just a matter of medium um, with certain specialties in certain areas. But that can, in, in the course of a curriculum, I think that can be easily covered in electives. But for me, it really falls under one, one big umbrella. And I think it's a problem that starts in the schools and is now affecting the way we work and practice uh, in, a, in a really bad way. Um, but anyway, the, the, so in terms of contemporary landscape design, we're looking more and more at these kinds of conditions, conditions that are not about kind of restoring native landscapes, but looking more at colonizing landscapes. So this is, you know, the kind of vegetation that grew here is really a result of the toxicity in the soil and the kind of species that thrived here were really a result of that uh, anthro, really anthropocentric kind of condition of our environment today. But was, you know, all this soil, ironically enough, was removed and put in another James Corner project in Fresh Kills. <laughs> Buried under the sort of cap of the landfill now. But I think it would have been really amazing to see this see this evolve, and I mean, it's I think it's really incredibly beautiful these species, and and maybe it was even an intent, early intention. If you look at some of the early renderings, they really just took uh, Sternfeld's photos and started collaging in walkways, and of, of course it's a little bit complicated because. What do you do when you have to waterproof the whole structure? <laughs> do you remove toxic soil and then put it back? It's also a, a kind of conundrum, so I, I, I can understand that too. But um, I think now what's there uh, in the kind of condition that's resulted is a little bit beyond people's expectations or, or imagination in a way. Um, but I, I think it would have been, this would have been an amazing site to do something else, particularly with this, rather than, you know, really introducing these kind of botanic species and decorative, yeah, I don't know, it feels, uh, I, I, I miss what Sternfeld <laughs> kind of kept for us as the sort of heterotopia here, uh, both in terms of space and landscape. We'll never have it back. Um, but I, what I'm also worried about is, you know, I think it still exists, uh, perhaps kind of at the intersection of, of the High Line and what surrounds it, but it's going away fast with the success of the High Line. So from famous architect to famous architect to corporate architect to massive, massive development. And I would also say massive overbuilding. Um, I think this is, a, this is something a city really struggles to deal with. I mean, the, so the Chinese city, I wanted to show that before this because you know, they were in their boom period. Uh, New York is in its boom period. 
And there's, you know, as, as architects, we're kind of conflicted with this conundrum of, great, times are good, we can build and we like to build, but how do we manage that building process? More importantly, how do cities manage that building process? And I, I love to see a, a city do well and grow and prosper, but if the result is this, I really, <laughs> I think it's, it's a huge, huge missed opportunity. I mean, this, look at this. It's really incredible, but that, it's not gonna be there for long. And beyond New York, uh, this is, of course, the Highline phenomenon is spreading like a, a kind of hopeful disease in a way <laughs> through, this being Tel Aviv, I'm not sure about that in Tel Aviv, given the climatic conditions. Oh, I think I, oh, this, sorry, this is Seoul. Um, so, spreading. Um, this is a, I don't know how many of you have followed this project, but uh, I was really happy to see this one die. Uh, <laughs> This is, uh, I really have no comprehension of what, why, or, I mean, looks like a kind of urban sort of Eden paradise, right? But really, what's the point? I'm not sure. A lot was, a lot was made of the, the kind of void space under here, and I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it was trying to, it was largely killed by, so the, for those of you who don't, maybe don't know it too much, it was, this was sort of one of these glory projects for a developer that then another developer who was against the first developer, I try not to mention names, um, financed the killing of this project by environmentalist groups. And <laughs> it's kind of interesting, um, but I think for good reason. Yeah, near the near the High Line. I mean, it's on the the pier. It's like the pier. Fifty-two or twenty-five. Right. Yeah, it's in Chelsea Piers. Yeah, you can. It's very clear, right? Yeah. Piers are very clear here. Um, but you know, all, this, is, this is the kind of killer slide, I think, for the environmentalist groups that said, actually, it's really flat and it's going to create a dead zone in the Hudson River and really destroy what every kind of environmental landscape group would want to do with the Hudson River in a, as a microcosm, uh, but could be a, another kind of disease that could expand. Um, I mean, I, I think it's just, Look at this. You guys are artists, right? Most of you. It's <laughs> what do you have here, right? The piers, really. And of course, another. I think this is kind of the worst form of object negative I could ever imagine. <laughs> um, I, I also don't know, really don't know the point of this glory project for, for a developer. But anyway, I, I, this is. You, you all probably know Smithson's displacement project. I mean, that's, that's a displaced island. I think that's a kind of compelling conceptual Eden that, <laughs> that's one version. Um, but really, the, I think that the clue was right here, right? There's so much you could do with that, that kind of condition that existed. I, I should have put in the slide of old New York where the, the Manhattan looks like a kind of comb with hundreds of piers surrounding it. It's amazing that these piers still exist, but I mean, these are, there's whole habitats existing in here. There, there, there could have been such a much more rich uh, project. Something else that could have been revealed in, in within the history of New York and experimental future conditions. But anyway, maybe somebody else will do that eventually. The Whitney is actually talking about doing something for other peer sites, uh, but 
so far they're talking about a kind of ghosted condition. It feels like something we've seen before, but we haven't seen the project, so let's give them the benefit of the doubt for now. Um, so now I'm moving into a project of, of my office, um, and it's kind of a, an, another way to get into, I mean, if this was one kind of historic infrastructure, definitely the Erie Canal is, is another kind of 400 mile long connection that used to exist. Uh, many parts still exist, but there are many big holes in it uh, between, so between Lake Erie uh, and the St. Lawrence Seaway when it needed a connection when before the St. Lawrence Seaway was built, this was the Erie Canal, as you all probably, probably know, connecting to the Hudson River through many, many locks. Um, looked like this in its glory days, kind of amazing overlap of aqueducts and water systems. So here's some of the existing condition of it. This is uh, near Syracuse, New York. Some of it's been turned into a park. And this was, so this was a competition that our office, basically the first project our office did and the first competition we entered. Uh, Syracuse being over here, DeWitt being here, and this red line is, was the site of the competition. There were a few different intervention sites that we were asked to look at. Um, but, so basically this stretch looks like this today. So in the, kind of after the canal was built a few years later, five to 10 years, it was completely paved over as a new form of transportation took over, the automobile and um, highways and things. So surrounding the former Erie Canal, which is now called Erie Boulevard, is familiar to all of us, the kind of suburban soup of, of development. This is a legacy to the canal. Some of the blocks that were used to construct the canal, this exists in kind of a sort of tombstone for it. Um, but interestingly enough, below the surface of that canal, I think nobody would remove those stone, those massive stone blocks, we thought. Um, they must still be there underneath that asphalt. So our proposal was a rather simple one. Um, we looked first at traffic studies with respect to Erie Boulevard that said actually the whole road could be completely closed and eliminated and traffic in surrounding Syracuse and the neighboring town of DeWitt would still be okay. Um, but we didn't want to eliminate it completely. So right now it's uh, similar to was it Woodward. It's quite, quite a, I think, a similar <laughs> condition. Kind of three lanes on e either side, no sidewalks, um, parking lots, suburban development, sometimes a median in the middle. So our, our proposal was to collapse the traffic to one side create much more of a slowed down urban condition, create a kind of, the, to this side of the Erie Boulevard is more a big box retail and things. So we wanted to create a kind of buffer, buffer like park between, and, and has its own access from another road. So we weren't eliminating the access to that big box retail, but kind of creating a buffer between that and the more intensely urban, more densified street, which has smaller scale retail. And, and our proposal would be future housing uh, along it, and then at the same time revealing a portion of the canal and then giving the canal a, a kind of new ecological and habitat kind of performance condition. So you can kind of see what's going on kind of in the broader scale in the urban plan, so before, after, major kind of road diet. Detroit's been talking about a lot of road diets, I think could seriously benefit from them. Um, I think, I don't know, my short time here, I, I, you guys know m much better than I, but there's a lot of traffic moving way too fast, way too freely, and constricting the development would really help the inner core of the city, I think, the infrastructure development. But maybe we can talk about that later. So this is the current view now uh, of Erie Boulevard, and then what we hoped our proposal could do. Um, 
basically transform it into this. So you still, so we're able to reveal a portion of the canal, but not sort of nostalgically simply replace it, re, you know, kind of restore it. That's definitely not our intention. So in the section perspective, you get this kind of experience. Uh, another part of the site uh, further down, uh, so this portion, we, we, we didn't win the overall master plan, but later there was a kind of public vote that happened. And uh, to our surprise, well, within all the entries, not a single one proposed revealing the old canal. We, we thought it was a sort of no brainer, but we're the only ones that did it. And in the public vote afterwards, this was the most popular idea, despite the winner of the competition. Um, now, uh, there's a statewide composition, uh, competition for the whole Erie Canal uh, beyond what the city of Syracuse and DeWitt did, so we'll be entering that. Um, this was another site that they asked us to look at crossing uh, highway condition. They asked us to, the, the competition was for a bridge over the highway. This is kind of, if you, if you add up all the lanes, there's maybe 12 lanes of traffic here. This is really an interstate freeway. And then there was a, it's not really shown here, but it was obvious to the people judging anyway. A, a kind of mess of roads that it made it impossible to make a bridged connection without crossing a number of roads. So given our proposal to cut and reveal the canal, we thought, let's just follow, let's ignore the uh, brief and forget about doing a bridge, we're gonna do an underpass that follows the path of the old canal and would seamlessly connect to what's on this end, uh, Erie Canal State Park, and our proposal for the boulevard. So this would also allow habitat and uh, kind of wildlife conditions to move from Erie Canal State Park through to that condition we are designing along in the, in the boulevard. So something like this. this I, I was kind of happy to see what we rode through. What's it, what, yeah, through to Quinter, you know. It's not a railroad, but it's a canal. Uh, so that's great precedent. I mean, I was, we were also worried about kind of dead bodies and graffiti in here and things, but it's working in Detroit. It can definitely work in Syracuse. <laughs> um, so afterwards, we, uh, kind of several months after, we, we met with the uh, urban planner of DeWitt, and he walked us into, this is Clinton Square in Syracuse, and you can see this little chain link thing. Um, the canal used to run through here. This used to be bridged over. It was an amazing space of commerce, but then now has been, this is an ice skating rink in the winter, but within that little chain link thing, he was, you know, he was pretty excited about our idea too, but he took us here and he said, this is proof of concept for you guys. This is the, this is the canal under the, <laughs> it's definitely still there, but only, <laughs> <laughs> this kind of one square meter hole. <laughs> it was amazing because we walked here in the pouring rain. You know, he's, he's just, I don't know, it's it kind of surreal experience. But um, so moving on to another project of ours in a very different place. We're going back to Asia. This is uh, in Da Nang in Vietnam, uh, central Vietnam. This is kind of what the, the landscape of the city looks like. Quite an exciting city with a really rich past, but really a city defined by the water's edge. When we entered the competition, was there was a master plan that had been won uh, for the whole Han River here, and then we were asked to look at a site that would become a, a kind of public square for the city. Um, given this kind of figure ground condition, we thought it was uh, really interesting to try and bring the water front into the space, this is the site, but really bring the figure of, of the river into the city and create a strong connection to that riverfront master plan. Um, this, was, this was just kind of an overview of our proposal. I'm not gonna get into the details. We, we were collab collaborating with another firm who was doing the majority of the landscape and, and also in collaboration with us. Uh, but our focus was really on uh, a market, which there's an existing market, 
Uh, it's not a particularly interesting concrete building, but very interesting kind of space, typical Vietnamese market condition, rich with you know, life in a kind of typical Vietnamese market. And that was something we were really interested in and wanted to also continue in our design. And this is a kind of, this is a first stock market in, in Vietnam. Um, but we're also interested in the kind of condition of a courtyard. Um, so these are kind of how we constructed our argument. These are things we show that we, are, we definitely do not propose this, given our idea of, kind of extending the figure of the river into the site. So not a single object. You, you could imagine kind of fragmenting different buildings to still have some kind of connection to the, to the waterfront. It's still not strong enough for us. Like I said, we were interested in the courtyard, so we simply proposed pushing the courtyard to a lower level. Um, above that, creating a kind of filtration landscape for the heavy storms that happen in, in Da Nang and all the stormwater runoff before it gets dumped into the river, just polluted runoff going into the river. We'd pre-treat it uh, before it goes to the river. And so, yes, not an object building, but a void. And this is kind of an overview of the project, this void cross-section. So we could still have a kind of courtyard market, very traditional type market. So we're really worried about uh, potential counter proposals that would lose that sense of, uh, of a traditional Vietnamese market and wanted to go, go against that perspective inside. But we also imagine it could be completely filled at night as a really dense night market or transformed you know, during Tet, during Vietnamese New Year, kind of start for a parade or something. And then the overview projecting quite literally into the waterfront and also projecting the space of the river into the city. Uh, we didn't win. This is the proposal that did. And in the context of overbuilding, again, I, I don't know, we're kind of shocked, but maybe not. Things are complicated in, in Vietnam. Um, the winner, this is their market. So they kept the existing market, but put a nice uh, Barcelona-esque roof over it. Right? We've all seen the Santa Catarina market in Barcelona. I don't know, this is blue version. <laughs> Uh, but oddly enough, the winner of the master plan for the whole river teamed with another architect and they won this competition. So uh, there's a kind of history of architects that win multiple projects in cities sometimes and you wonder if it's really an honest competition in the end. And maybe I'm, I, I don't know, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I, um, so this, I want to come back again to this multidisciplinary aspect. Um, this is, I think, something I'm intensely interested in. This is why I'm showing the Campidoglio. Uh, our, our collaboration with, with landscape architects, the, the, the reason we collaborated with that team was because it would be a true collaboration and wouldn't be this, what, what's happened in our discipline is a, a real division, okay, architects do the buildings, the landscape do the, they green it up and you know, that, that's it. And they come up with their own concept and architects come up with their concept. I think I'm, I'm really an advocate of a time where like Michelangelo did, you know, he was confronted with this site. He didn't do the buildings per se. He did their, as we all know, he did their facades. He did the landscape, right? It was a synthetic work of art. I'm not saying it, it really needs to be done by one person, one kind of so-called master or genius or whatever, but uh, one interdisciplinary team. Some, some projects are now moving that way, some initiatives, but I'm really, I mean, this is what's encouraging to me about being at Cranbrook because it's, it's happening here in one way and I think it should happen in other schools between the, you know, the different fields that are related to architecture. Uh, so I'm gonna show just a quick succession of case, sort of case studies of um, negatives, 
kind of negative space planning. I, as I mentioned, I would talk about speculative negative space planning. This one was executed, of course, by under the initiative of Pope Sixtus, uh, kind of cutting through Rome to, to unify it through these, uh, we can say similar for Usman, I mean, they all had their political agendas, of course. Another kind of related version, but more of a, a framework, this is another project I really admire, uh, Tange and Yiklan's uh, project for, for Mecca, kind of simple framework that during, outside of the Hajj would be like this, kind of, uh, kind of at the edge, edge of the mountains, framing a space, and then during the Hajj, really intensely filled. Um, and then, I don't know how, I mean, probably you all studied Barcelona's planning, but this was, I think this is really still a relevant example today and something we could perhaps learn from in our cities uh, relative to the idea of urban removal, subtraction, and um, overbuilding. So uh, Ildefan Surda's plan for Ishampla. This is, this is the old medieval walls, the demolishing of the old medieval walls around Barcelona. Barcelona at the time was dealing with epidemics in the city, sort of its own problem with urban build, uh, overbuilding and um, congestion, disease spreading due to that congestion in the medieval city. So to build a city outside the city, uh, was his initiative. Uh, if, you, if you know Ildefan Surda, his, he was a civil engineer. Um, but initially, his proposal started with adding plumbing, um, really basic infrastructure to deal with the flooding. Barcelona was also flooding a lot at the time. Um, and this, this was his plan and why I want to, it's not so much about what, this is what it became today uh, for whatever, whatever reason, this is what it is today, but definitely was not the intention. Um, the urban plan kind of went in a different direction due to the success, in a way, uh, and development. It was probably, I would say, overbuilt. So the kind of density of these courtyards was much more than he envisioned. Um, this was the urban pattern. I, I think this is a really brilliant pattern that he came up with this kind of series of interchangeable pieces, the solid pieces relative to the void. You have this kind of infinite puzzle that could be constructed. Um, with you know, rich park spaces intermingling and not, not kind of fully built up perimeter blocks. I think it's really interesting to think of these different patterns. Um, Similarly for Savannah, a city like Savannah, with its own kind of protocol, I think Keller Easterling, uh, a great influence of mine, wrote, wrote a lot about this, a kind of, with each ward there would be a public space associated and then a reciprocal agricultural space that, that would be built and that's, that's how Savannah evolved and developed its own unique urban texture. Um, Another texture project, this is a project done by my partner, Marcus Carter, and a few others for Philadelphia. And I bring up Philadelphia, uh, of course, because of its situation relative to Detroit, facing many of the same issues with depopulation. I mean, you, this could be Detroit, right? Uh, this is the grid of Philadelphia. So their proposal was to create a new urban texture through collecting and kind of unifying these different blocks, not as uh, solids, but as voids and as public spaces that could then be, this could be the kind of armature for a new future development, but sort of dealing with uh, the removal in a different way. So in the broader scale of the city, these would be these uh, kind of urban framework, void spaces within the city, infrastructure of the city and how they're superimposed in the densest sort of areas that have also been facing the greatest amount. This is the deep population in the closer to the inner core and essentially creating a new kind of park landscape 
for the city. For some reason, I think about this project relative to Detroit, of course, not, not literally, not, uh, but I think it's really interesting to think of negative space proposals for, for a city of Detroit. This is kind of an aerial view, but yeah, you could really imagine this. It's not so different, right? <laughs> this being Detroit. Um, these, of course, are Alex McLean's photos of Detroit. You're all familiar with this, but I was um, I was a little bit surprised, to be honest, uh, being on the reviews today a bit, and I really think it would be interesting to bring more of your projects in into Detroit. I know you're exploring a lot of different issues with making, but I, I find the rich. I mean, maybe other, enough other people are doing this, but I doubt it. I, th I think. Okay, maybe. Maybe you are, correct me if I'm wrong. But I just didn't see, <laughs> I don't know, I would, if I was here, I'd be like, keep bringing it on, right? I don't know, but I, I, I felt like, not that I'm trying to tell you what to do, that's absolutely the wrong thing for Cranbrook, and not, I would never do that. But I, re, I, I really think a lot of the projects you're doing could really benefit from kind of the collision with the conditions, but at least in architecture. It's really an amazing place to be, I mean, to be working, even an exhibition, right? Look at what an amazing place to do an exhibition, right? I know Saarinen's buildings are great to do exhibition, but this is phenomenal. <laughs> so is this. <laughs> anyway, so this is where I end. Um, kind of end here. And maybe, maybe I've triggered some thoughts in, in you and in others, and we can have some kind of a, yes. <laughs> We're gonna have some sort of a broader interactive uh, discussion. Yes, Mark, bring it on. Be, was being unbuilt and now, I, yeah. You, you guys are more of an expert than me, for sure. I, I don't know, it's my first time here. Exactly. Architects, urbanists, landscape uh, artists. I think a kind of coalition of people, even a kind of think tank for Detroit of sorts. I think it would be great to see. Uh, maybe it's happening. I, I don't. I don't know. Maybe it is going on in a, in a kind of start. And then, I mean, I've heard about different kinds of rezoning efforts, but maybe some of you know and. 
could help illuminate us. But yeah, I think if there's more state and private interests, not just the interests of developers, although I think the development interests are crucial, the city won't grow without their investment. Um, but these kinds of integrated collaborations are, would be the, I mean, that, that's the potential Detroit has. That, it, it's a, Detroit is, I think you're absolutely right, is, has an opportunity that few cities have ever been confronted with. And it, it's incredible, but it, it will only happen in a conceptually <laughs> compelling, interesting way if there's this collaboration, I think. Love these initiatives, <laughs> private initiatives too, right? But yeah, go on. Yeah, there are some kind of marginalized within the city that have been able to maintain their slowly kind of getting a critical mass of students to uh, Yeah. But I mean I, I really think there needs to be a bigger vision for it. That's why I showed the the showed Barcelona, the Champla plan. I mean uh, sort of essentially, he was the first person to use the word urbanization, right? This is, Detroit is, has the potential to re-urbanize, completely rethink itself. So the texture, the pattern that could take, it has to, I really think it, there has to be a much broader vision than how can we redevelop, uh, you know, small scale factory buildings that we're nostalgic about, and of course are great, but what's the bigger bigger framework? I mean, there's, there's a huge, huge, huge potential to create a city that we've never seen, right? As an architect, this is just a personal question, right? Or um, for there's like a lot of Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, in the the history of urban planning, I mean there's, there's opportunities that have come up. I mean, think about the I don't what's your background what I mean what are what are you within the inter interdisciplinary just get okay <laughs> we're, we're all <laughs> a lot of things but she's in the architecture okay um, well okay I'll just answer personally first and maybe we can go from there but rather than a, let's say a, a new town in China a kind of city from scratch or Indonesia or whatever uh, I, personally, as an architect, I love to engage with existing context, existing fabric, uh, layers of history, it's something that has been there before. That I mean, that, it's why I show the Erie Canal project, I think, because there's a potential to reveal something about that history and create layers, especially in American cities, because there's not so many layers in many, many American cities that grew up from the time of the automobile. And that's why I show the very first thing is uh, my background and my kind of visceral reaction and distaste for that. Uh, actually trauma, really physical trauma that I experienced living in that environment. Um, there's a chance to, to, to deal with uh, yeah, existing substance. So for me, it's, it's not at all about kind of ruin porn or anything like that, or an interest in, uh, in fetishization of it, but there's history, there's context, even if it's a short history, it's something to, to build with. Well, if, if we're <coughs> 